So the goals of this talk, I just want to get this out of the way. I'll let you read it. Since it's a lot of text, and then I'll say it quickly. It's to show how you can use modern application architecture when designing and building your geo-inclusive applications. So why am I using the word geo-inclusive? Why? This is, to, this is your quiz to see how much you were paying attention the whole day. What did, G, what did Adam say this morning? It's not special. It's not special. That's right. Most places where we think that... How many of you are GIS practitioners or were GIS practitioners in a former life? And what was the mantra you always heard? Spatial is special. We're the high priesthood of GIS. You can't do GIS unless you've gotten a degree from some obscure... Can, Canadian University, where everybody's cogs or whatever it's called, where everybody seems to come from. If you haven't trained with those people, you're nothing and you can't even touch our software. You need a special license. And I think we have now, I think one of the other things Google did a really good job of showing when they unleashed the API for putting dots on a map is that there's a lot of stuff you can do with, in spatial without having to do all that stuff. And so even some of the things that we think are totally spatial apps are not. It's, they actually have a whole bunch of attribute data and other stuff that's happening. And quite often, most of our apps may not have any maps, but the maps add a good visualization or a good, or may not even have a map. It just may be asking a spatial question under the hoods, right? So I would like to start, start thinking of geo-inclusive apps. It's not, I use PostGIS for all the things, or I don't use PostGIS at all, right? That's bad thinking. The next part is to show you live running infrastructure and code. And the final part is to have fun, especially at this part in the day. And that's usually my whole main goal with most of my talks is that everybody should leave at least being entertained, if nothing else. Um, the application, uh, does everybody I hope by this point understands that your crunchy logo or our spirit animal or whatever you want to call it is a hippo, right? So hence the diagram. And this is going to be, and I want to make this really clear, an administrator, an administrator interface. This is not the general public interface, okay? Because I'm going to be doing some things in this app that some people at some government agencies might say, I'm never going to let my users do that kind of thing. What are you talking about? That's because this is the administrator interface, OK? So it's the administrator interface for managing wildfire in Santa Cruz County. I live in Santa Cruz County. And so you might have heard that we had a little a couple bonfires go awry out there. And so I thought this was kind of timely and kind of just putting it together. And I know the area, so I can talk about some of the stuff. Any questions? I'm going to start calling on people, by the way, too. All the rest of the speakers were way too easy on all of you. And whenever they said, anybody have any questions? Nobody answered. So I find that hard to believe. So I'm going to actually start making people talk because that's, it's been too long and I don't want to be the only one. So the main point of this whole demo, there are no specialized servers. And Adam said this again this morning, right? The main point is you can do what you've always done with all your other application architecture. You can now do that with spatial as well. So let's go through that, right? What this means for you, what are the benefits of no specialized servers? One, there's no need to learn any specialized heavyweight servers. And I'm not calling any company out by name. Both the open source community and the proprietary community have their own versions of heavyweight servers. Right? This is not necessarily a call out of a company I used to work at that I hold a grudge against sometimes because of how it was when I was working there. It has nothing to do with that part. I'm trying to keep vendor neutral. We as a community, though, have thought spatial is special. We need to big, build big spatial special servers to do this stuff that's really special that we do. Right? And I don't think that's necessarily the case that's needed anymore. And I'm going to hopefully demonstrate it. There's no weeks of training for single-use software. So when the, either you use GeoServer or you use something like Esri Spatial Server, usually you're, you bring in somebody to train people on specifically that survey, server for a long period of time. There's certifications around it and all this other stuff. Not required anymore. <clears throat> you can use the same tools and techniques you use in your other applications. And your team instead now becomes a few geospatial people, right? Who un can you guys see that in the back on the bottom? Kind of mediocre. I know that it's a little low. I'll read it to you, though. Don't worry. I got you covered. Um, hire a few geospatial people who don't need vendor expertise, right? So they don't have to be trained in any specific software. They have to understand the spatial algorithms and what you can do with spatial data. But they don't have to say, I know how to click this button or configure these things, right? Then you hire normal other application vendor, uh, application developers, or you already have them on staff. They're building normal applications with the spatial people, helping them to understand the bits that they need about the spatial part. Right? It's not that I have to write all of the stuff because I have all this knowledge. It's, oh, I'll teach you the things you really basically need to know. And if it's something really specialized, these people can take care of it.
but you're usually handling normal Java, Python, those kind of devs. And then you're doing normal system administrators and DBAs with their favorite tools and procedures. Right? There's no specialized, oh, we got to do this this one particular way. So I'm almost, we're going to go through the architecture really quickly. So this is your normal application architecture today, just so we can all level set. Is that OK? Good? It, actually, all right, now this is where the quiz comes in. This is ground zero at the beginning of your app, like the basic, the base grounding. You have a firewall. You know you're going to be talking to desktop, mobile, and web. What is this symbol? Nicely done. You don't get to answer any more questions. We're going to make, make this a team activity. So this is Kubernetes, running something you're going to be using for running containers. And I don't care if this is hosted. I don't care if this is self-hosted self or hosted in somebody's cloud. But you're thinking about or you're already doing stuff where you're moving stuff into containers, and you need some way to manage them. right? So this is a normal application, not a spatial one. It's cut off entirely on the screen. You can't even see it because it's on the bottom of the screen. But imagine, if you will, there's stacks of PostGIS, PostgreSQL servers here, stack of PostgreSQL servers here, and flat files, like file-based assets, images, something like that that you're going to serve up, right? That's the base layer. OK. Serving off of that stuff, you're going to have containerized stuff, which may or may not be talking to a database, some REST endpoints, which may or may not may be talking to multiple databases, maybe only talking to one endpoint database. And then you have some sort of asset server. So what's an example of this asset server? You don't get to answer. You've written a web application and you want to serve up images. What are you going to use to serve up images? S3. No. You don't get to answer anymore either. <laughs> no. What are you going to use? It's really simple. This is a simple one. This is not a trick question. I'm a nice guy. Be you may begin with an A. Yes, Apache. Or there's another one that all the hipsters use. It begins with an N, and it might end with an Nginx, right? Right. So that's an example of what this thing would be. It's just something that's serving up flat assets on your from your um, from your servers, right? And so this is would. And then you might have. You can't see it, but I'll tell you again because you're so trusting. There is like some sort of desktop system over here that's doing some operations against your like these are Tableau users who are reaching in directly, or maybe some. Uh, data scientists or something doing direct operations against the database as well, right? And then what do you add to this? You're probably going to add some sort of modern identity server, right? Because every, in, the, in this enterprise, all this stuff, no one really talks about it, but you really actually need to have some way of saying, this user who came in is allowed to access this, allowed to access this, that kind of stuff, right? You tie that together, and then you get all these things talking to the firewall, and Bob's your uncle, you got a nice app, right? Is this, okay. On this side, this side, now, yeah, see, can't look at your phone anymore. I caught you. Is this, <laughs> is this basically the architecture that most of you guys are starting to look at in your organization? Something like that, right? So any complaints about this architecture? Are we all agree that this is a fairly standard and a good architecture in general? And what most of you are either have or striving towards? OK, ready? We're to make it ready? Now let's make it spatial. That's it, right? So there's, notice nothing has changed except I've added some spatial bits here. Like, oh, well, this might have QGIS on it. And this set of databases is PostGIS enabled. And this one might have some spatial bits on it, like some Python library or R library that's doing some spatial stuff. But it might just be, this is just serving up spatial answers, right? This container might be a spatial package, but it's still just a container. And this one might be something that serves up spatial assets, flat file assets, right? And so. What has changed in this, in terms of how you approach your work? Nothing. It's just the bits in here might change. There's no big servers. There's no specialized stuff. It's the same workflow and the same architecture. So with that in mind, see, it's done. With that in mind, it's time for the demo, right? I'm going to put this back here, because I hate standing behind podiums. It's kind of hard to type without, be, without being behind the laptop. All right, and yeah. So let's go. So I think I need to be here. So let's start here. Here's our app. Oh, I lost my port forwarding. So here's our app, right? Beautiful. Right? Thank you. I'll tell my UX people that this is beautiful. All right, so this is a, just a normal web app. And what's actually going on behind it, what we're hosting behind it, this, how many of you have heard of OpenShift? So I'm using OpenShift here, but this could be any Kubernetes distribution. 
I used to be on the OpenShift team when I was at Red Hat, so I feel very comfortable in here, so that's why I'm actually using it. Um, and it's also got a very nice front end compared to most Kubernetes distros, so it's better for demos. But this could be any Kubernetes distribution that shows what I'm doing. And what I'm going to do now is talk to you how I stand up each of the pieces of pieces under me. Right, so I've got a Kubernetes, I got a Kubernetes cluster ready to go. Let's make the different pieces. So what's the first part we needed? What was on that bottom layer before? This side. No, not you. This side, not you. What was on the bottom side before? Postgis, WAC files. Yes, PostGIS. We'll start with just PostGIS. So how do you get post? Oh, see, you guys really need lava layers. So how do you get the PostGIS part started? This is, so I'm gonna show off some of the, have any of you ever heard of operators in Kubernetes? Nice job. So I'm gonna show you how easy it can be using these modern practices to spin up a PostGIS cluster with replication, all right? So now, what I'm doing is I'm gonna actually, what I've already installed on this cluster is the crunchy operator. And what an operator is, is it's a, Kuber, it's a Kubernetes concept that allows you to tie together complicated software that knows how to take care of itself. It kind of packages up and knows how to do upgrades and do all sorts of bring up, bring down, bring rec replicas up. And so I've got this operator in already installed and I'm gonna use that. So that port forward is down. Let's bring up this port forward. I haven't exposed the operator to the outside world because I just don't want anybody coming into it. And then I know nobody likes watching typos. So I'm gonna paste the command and then we'll watch it. Is that big enough in the back? Yeah, or is that too big? Can I go back one down? Or is it, no? I can? Are you messing, who said no? You're just messing with me because you're behind the column. It's like that voice in the back of the, my head that keeps telling me how much my mother hated me. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that command and then I'll, talk, I'll walk you through what we actually did. All right, so what this command is actually saying PGO is our operator. I'm saying create a cluster. I'm going to call it my GIS cluster. It's going to use the crunchy post GIS operator. Oh, it's not wrapping. It's going to use the Hold on. Where am I going to is anybody, no, no one's going to, everyone's going to answer no. I was going to say anybody use gedit here, but they don't. Give me a second. I'm going to show you the command. I just want you to be able to read it. While we're, while we're waiting for that to show up, let me show you what's now actually happening. I said make it in the demo workspace. There was nothing there before. I now have a GIS cluster. except on steroids and way better. Sound good? And this actually allows us to do all sorts of backup commands from the command line rather than having to learn all that stuff. So I've now actually spun up a master and a replica for my cluster. This is streaming replication. And what was in the command to do that create cluster, my, the name of the cluster, the image I want is the PostGIS image. I want one replica, and I want it to do auto failover. Right, and so again, this is showing some of the modern, the modern architectural practices. I've just gotten PostGIS. If I was a developer, as a sysadmin, would you trust a developer to do that command? The answer should be yes, because everything's automated. How much do you, how many of you are sysadmins or manage your Postgres instances for people? Yeah, and do you like it when your developers spin up their own custom configuration of Postgres and PostGIS on your machine, on their own machines? No, why, because? Yeah, and it's nothing like production, right? And so they say, hey, it worked on my laptop, why doesn't it work for you? You figure out why it doesn't work. That's the nice part about moving into this containerized world with, an op with the operator, is I've standardized that entire process. Did the developer care that they got, that what was happening behind the scenes? The answer is, how many of you are developers here? Did you care if I spun it up that way? No, why, because what did you really want? PostGIS, that's all I really wanted. Just give it to me so I can use it. I don't want to learn Ansible. I don't want to learn anything else. So 
All right, we spun that up. We got replicas going. If we have time, since I got stuck at the end of the day, if we had time, I would show you, have any of you heard of PG Badger? So PG Badger is basically a little piece of software that you put with your Postgres instance, and you hit it, and it basically goes through your log file and creates nice HTML output saying how your server was doing. And we've actually got that customized, and I can sh I've already put it into my cluster, and I can show you how we can use it. One of the other things, though, is how many of you have heard of, um, how many of you have actually heard of connection pooling? Let's start with connection pooling. Everybody hopefully is, knows that their application should use connection pooling. When you do connection pooling, who raised their hand? You raised your hand, didn't you, for connection pooling? Okay, so now you're on the spot. This is what you get for being brave. Do you actually do it in your app server or in your code, or do you do it outside? In your connection, in your code. So, and that's what most, I'm a Java developer long, way back, and I also do Python stuff, and we usually we use the, the container, the JBoss or Tomcat to do our connection pooling. The problem is, what if I want to change a setting? What do I have to do to my app? You have to bounce your whole app, right? And that means downtime for your app and all sorts of stuff. Since joining Crunchy, because I was never aware of this before, I've learned that you can actually have connection pools outside of your application. So what we're going to be using here is uh, what did I, like PG Bouncer. Right? So this is actually a connection pool that lives by itself. And you connect to this, and it'll handle all the, your code doesn't have to even think about it. Your app devs don't even have to think about connection pooling and setting it up and doing singletons and all that fun stuff. You're just like, oh, no, just point it at this endpoint. This is your Postgres instance. They don't know that there's a bouncer in front of it. And to add that to my cluster, hold on one sec. I'm going to take this down one notch. Is that OK in the back? Can you still read it? How about now? OK. So the namespace, again, was demo. Got to fix that. And then it was my GIS cluster. But so basically all I'm saying here is, Again, PGO create, I want a PG bouncer, and I want it with my GI, I want it to know how to talk to my GIS cluster, and I want it, the demo, the, it's in the demo namespace. So I go back to my command line again. I do that command. Nope. What did that just do? Hold on. There. Ready? No. What is it doing? There must be something else that's going on here. So PGO, create, and then now. What is <clears throat> The Linux terminal is rock solid. All right. There we go. So now, do you see it? Oh, you can't see because it's on the bottom. What it says here is I did the command, and then it says my JS cluster PG bouncer added. Right? And so if I go back to my view, And I go back to the demo namespace. You will see there is now another. No, you won't because it's on the bottom of the screen. So if you're in the back, you won't see it. But here, there's a new deployment for a new container that's called mygiscluster-pgbouncer. Right, so now I all have to do, why am I showing you all this stuff? And you're like, I have no idea, and it's really freaking boring. The reason I'm showing you all this stuff is because I'm trying to show how easy all this boring stuff can actually be, because this boring stuff is what makes for a rock solid platform. Right? I, what's the most important part of your application? Like if all of your app, if your all your app servers died, would that be a tragedy? It'd be sad and you'd be upset, but you could bring them all back up. If all of your data goes away, how you feeling? Pretty miserable. Time to bankrupt the company or I'm about to have a congressional investigation, depend on where you work, right? So the whole idea here is we're trying to get a really good rock solid data structure underneath and how easy it can be to set that up. Now we've got our database set up. We all good on that? Okay, the next piece we're gonna talk about, and I can, if we have time I'll go into, I can show other things that are cool about all this stuff, but I wanna get through the whole architecture first. The next thing that we're gonna show up, up is something that Paul talked about earlier, you're like, what do you mean? That was like 600 things. Which one were we talking about here? And the answer is base maps, right? Almost every mapping application needs a base map. Is that right? All of you? Some of you create your own. Some of you use Google. In this case, we're going to say, I want to create my own. So I've got my databases in here. So the first piece is I'm going to load this full of data. 
So what did we load? So I'm going to go to our project now that's actually pre-built because watching people import data is really no fun. <clears throat> so this is the project that we're actually using. That web front end that you saw is here. This is this containerized piece, and it's got its own URL, right? And this is actually auto-building. It's a basically a just JavaScript being served up by a Node application, right? And it basically, notice how there's been 35 deployments of this. That's because we've auto set it up to GitHub so that every time we check it, it into master, it auto rebuilds and deploys, right? So an automated process there again. All right, so for our base layer, the first thing we want is, okay, we're gonna need some of our own data. So inside of ours, we, up, we uploaded all the data from Santa Cruz County. I went, I live there, I know they have the GIS system, I download all the data, they give their stuff in 4320. Is everybody here know what I say, mean when I say 4326? No, it's okay to say no. Good, thank you for being brave. Get an extra sticker on the way out. Um, 4326, it, remember when Paul was talking about projections? Or were you walk, looking at your phone at that point? Okay, good. So 4326 is the projection that basically says the same things that come off of your GPS on your phone. No projection, but we're gonna give a spheroid, right? This is the shape of the earth. It's unprojected lat long with a spheroid. And for some strange reason, the Santa Cruz County GIS department gives their data out in 4326. I have no idea why. And I was like, that is not good for Santa Cruz County because that's really good for shooting missiles and tracking people with phones and finding the closest Starbucks, but it's not good for measuring area and stuff like that. So I, I projected it all to California State Plain, NAT 83, zone three or whatever. So it's highly accurate. So all the data in our database and I'm, why am I bringing up this inane fact, you sound just like Paul again, is because the point of this is the GIS specialist on your team said, look, we're gonna be using this data for a lot of purposes, that projection matters a lot. This is gonna allow us to have accurate distances, accurate areas, the stuff we care about. The application developers, you'll see, don't actually have to care about that all that much if they learn just a little bit of SQL and caught that piece where Paul talked about the transform function. Right? That's all they really need to know about. We're not having to produce massive data sets everywhere and duplicate it, all right? So base layer, long way of getting there. What we're using for the base layer, map box tiles from Tile Mill. Have any of you ever heard of Tile Mill or Tile Server GL? We're just gonna stand up Tile Server GL in a container and we've already baked the map box tiles into the container. This is a container I built myself, all right? So that one is this service right here. SC, Santa Cruz, Tile Server GL. So if you look, I think I actually put it up on, I, I haven't practiced this part, so, and we're crunched on time. I'm not gonna actually show you the Docker file or the doc, where the Docker file is. I can show you afterwards if we have time. But basically what I did is I stood up a container running tile server GL. I'm pointing it at the map box tiles that we've already pre-downloaded to render the OpenStreetMap open layer underneath. And the only thing that's exciting in here I'm trying to think if there's anything exciting to show you about the container. It's like 370 megs and that includes all the data. Uh, I don't think there's anything else exciting. Oh, maybe the logs. Yeah, there's just showing get requests, right? So you can see this is just doing normal get requests. What that gives us though, back in our demo app, let me zoom out one layer. Cause this has actually got Tegelo running. There's, there's no Tegelo. This is just, this is just tile server GL at this point. So what's happened is I created the container, ran the container, said, hey, um, OpenShift or Kubernetes, give this a URL. I point the URL, and so this open layers slash React app encodes that URL as this is where my tiles are gonna come from, and we've got tiles, okay? And so this is another advantage for most of you are GIS people. How many, want, do you want, how many of you want your application developers trying to figure out how to make Mapbox tiles? or doing it themselves. Do you want your app devs doing that? No, so in a containerized world, you make the containers with the tiles built in, and you say, hey, here's the container you could use. Don't touch it. As a matter of fact, you can't even touch it. So here it is, and just run it, right? So the expert gets to run it, and the person, the consumer just says, awesome, thanks for doing that work for me, because I didn't want to learn about Macbox tiles anyway, right? So we've got a part of our base layer. But the other part is, because Paul talks about how awesome vector tiles, you all are like, well, where's my vector tiles now? I need my dynamic vector tiles. So let's do the vector, dynamic vector tiles. These we're gonna pull straight out of the database using a vector tile generator written in Go called Tegela. Have any of you heard of Tegela? No? Some? So 
part of what we're talking about today, some of you, is also hearing back from you if this architecture makes sense and this is something like that you would want to see in your own organization. We're using Tegla today as a stand-in for a vector tile generator. One of the drawbacks about Tegla, and I'll say this, Paul showed some really nice stuff that PostGIS can do right out of the box. Tegla is a generic tile generator, so it can talk to shape files, it can talk to geo packages, so it can't take advantage of all the nice optimizations that we've had in PostGIS. So imagine it's Tegla for now, but we might swap that out at a later point when we're doing stuff. Not in this demo, but in the future. So here's Tegla. Tegla was a little harder to get started. Tegla, the Tegla project makes a container that they put up on Docker Hub, so I was like, oh yes, nice, they're already containerized, they're the future. And then I was like, oh no, it's a really generic container that's intended for like just running Docker run, right? Because most people in real environments don't run just Docker run for their infrastructure. So I had to do some work to get it going. I'll show you the deployment first. But this also will give me a chance to show about why moving to this architecture is a really good thing. So the configuration for this deployment, I'll start with, oh, there's no way anybody's gonna be able to read that unless you're in the front row. Let's see. So, the image, the Docker image we're running, is go spatial slash Tegla. So this is coming right off a of Tegla hub, right? I have to pass it to some commands. This is where I was talking about where they made it really generic and not really for running. So I have to tell it, hey, you know what, Tegla? Call the actual command itself, tell it to serve, and your config file that I want you to use is found at slash op slash Tegla underscore config slash config dot toml. Toml is, if someone said, hey, YAML's not enough hell, let's come up with another indented format that nobody really likes and call it TOML. So it, it, it's all, I hate it. Ugh. So anyway, this is, what, this is what Tegla uses. It reads its configuration from a TOML file. So it's like, oh, that's kind of cool. But what happens in a container? Well, do you want to see how easy it is for me to spin up another instance of this? We're getting a ton of load. There's a fire happening. We need more Tegla servers. So all I have to do here, there's four running currently. Uh, that's not what I want. Hold on. Click on this. I want five. Oh, no, I want six. There's a lot of load. Oh, the load is really increasing. There's seven. I'm now running seven Tegla servers. Right? And they're all still talking to the PostGIS database underneath. How much, how, who, what beeper has got notified there? As a matter of fact, I could, in Kubernetes, you can have this auto scale based on CPU load. And then it'll scale itself back down. This is one of the benefits of moving into containers. And the, one of the ways I was able to achieve that is I put that TOML file in not a real TOML file, in a not a real file. It's actually in what's called a config map. So here's what's called Tegla map. And so what I say is, okay, the key is config.toml and the value is actually the contents of the file. And here's the part where we start using PostGIS. I want to connect to PostGIS, but I don't even have to specify the username and password. All that stuff is going to get specified through when the operator got spun up, it specified all that stuff and put it into the environment. So that was all auto-configured. I just have to use the environment variable. And then, this one statement here is the only complicated thing. Hold on, you can put this down now. Actually, let me edit it, because it makes it easier to work with. All right. or I thought it would make it easier to work with. Here. So this is the SQL statement that we're gonna actually use. And so what Tomal, what um, Tegel is looking for, is this. So the SQL that you're actually gonna go to PostGIS and get your stuff with is, it wants the binary representation of the result. What are we doing with this one? Not you not you, someone else who was paying attention during this morning, and I just, who said it? Nicely done, Ni extra sticker for you too. This is the statement that Paul talked about this morning going from one projection to another, right? I told you the data was in California State Plain. The first time um, Adam and I spun this up, we're like, it's showing up, all the data is showing up fine on the viewer, why isn't it showing up on the map? What's wrong with the map, what's going on? Why can't I see any of the tiles? It says it's spinning them out, it's because we were in California State Plain and not 3857, which is Web Mercator, which is what Paul was talking about before, is that cheap Mercator projection. They could have just might as well used the normal Mercator. Um, so what we're doing here is we're saying, take the geometry, 
take, transform the geometry for each geometry that comes out, project it, and then give a binary representation of it, and that's it. As geom, right? So basically just return the geometries from the, and the, the, GI, the GID, the unique ID, the APN number, and the fire hazard status, because we're going to render on that. Does that make sense? Everybody still with me? Kind of? Okay. At least half of you are still with me? So that's the only part where we need to do sig the SQL. The rest is all like, oh, which field do you want to use? We set that up, and then we make that into a, we make that into a map, which we call parcels, and then we give it a center point. And that gives us, we then expose that at a URL. And when we do that, back in our demo, you saw it earlier when I came in. But if I zoom in, these are all vector tiles. All the parcels are vector tiles now. Right? And I think if I did, did this properly, when I zoom in one level, you'll notice it's actually super fast. And it, one, because it can start caching the stuff. But also, if you do partial zoom ins, like if you use your scroll wheel, which I do not have on my, because Open Layers allows that WMS, oh, I can get zoom level 1.25. It doesn't refetch the tiles because it's vectors already. It just says, oh, I've already got them. And they're close enough in terms of drawing, so I'm not going to refetch. I'll just zoom in. Because these are actually vectors, not rasters on top. Which also allows us to do things like this. Right? This is the ones where there's a fi high fire hazard already. Someone in the county has already designated these as fire, high fire hazard. So what's the workflow that we can now enable? Oh, one of the field people went out, and they found out that this park right here is actually a high fire hazard. So I click on it. It says it's currently a high fire hazard. Is it a fire hazard? Yes, yes it is. I click on it, we pull it back, and dynamically on the fly, we've now changed the update. And anybody, who, we had to refresh here because we had to basically get this one tile back, but anybody who came in after this would get it already with that status. What would the normal workflow for this be? If I wanted to teach someone else in the back office how to do this, how would I do it? And I didn't have the web app already, what would you be doing? Okay, let me teach a Q, uh, QGIS or ArcGIS desktop. Let me get a light, actually, let me get a license for that app. Let me make sure it can go on your machine. Let's go through IT and make sure your machine can run it. Then let me teach you how to use it. Then let me show you how to edit a table. Then let me show how to make a map. And then I'll let you go in and edit the table and update it. And here, what you can do with this architecture is build custom purpose apps, the no normal way you build other apps, and just set them equal to, they can do that one specific task without having access to messing up everything else in the database which is what you don't want, right? The other part you're probably, what's the next part you're gonna ask about what I just did? How did I do the update? No, no one cared. That was just magic that they were willing to accept. How did you do the update? Hey, thanks. <laughs> thanks for not leaving. <laughs> when, when you promised you were gonna, when you said you were gonna. So that's as easy, so this is that thin layer that we've been talking about, right? Where this is the same as any other thing that we were doing, we, any other app that you would do. Here's my. How many of you have heard of Flask for Python? This is just a simple Flask app that I'm writing REST requests and responses with. I don't have to learn some weird protocol or something. I'm not going to walk through all the code. I'll just show you the part that I do for that one part, the fire hazard one. So parcel fire hazard is my URL. Pass in a parcel ID, which we can grab from the click. And then all I say is, uh, on a get request, I just give it back to you so you can draw it and I can give you the, some information. The put request, which is what the update button did, it's really complicated SQL. Update accessible parcels, set fire hazard equal to where GID equals to. And the, fi the fire hazard, we said yes, and the parcel ID we already had. Right, so again, how many of your app devs sh should be able to understand this? Hopefully all of them, or they should be fired. Um, so the point here is there was, you didn't have to suddenly train a whole bunch of people in spatial stuff to get this done. Here at app dev, I already took care of all the spatial stuff. They set up the Tegla, they set up the open layers. Normal app devs just do this, but they're still working on your spatial app. They didn't have to go into some custom weird framework to under and weird nomenclature or anything. It's just a normal table update. No, well, I won't say it. Never mind. <coughs> all right, so that's our note, that's our fire hazard service. The other service that we have running is, and this one, that's not very much spatial technology, right? That's just a normal, we haven't really done much that's post GIS in there except get back geometries. This other one is an active fire notification app. So the, the thought behind this one is, 
oh, there's a fire somewhere. I want to find people, like Paul's original use case, I want to find people within a certain distance, send them an SMS message saying, get out of your house, it's about to burn down, right? Um, and so we have, a f I didn't even talk about, you guys want to see the geocoder in action? So this geocoder is actually using the Tiger geocoder. And I found a new address today that I want to geocode because there was a mountain lion in my neighborhood, in my area. She took her cubs and put them under this person's car. So the person goes out to work in the morning and there's a mountain lion and two cubs sitting under her car. They let the, the mom took off into the park and they let the mount, they didn't, they left the cubs there and the mom came back and took them out in the middle of the night. I thought it was actually pretty cool. I kind of want to wake up with a mountain lion in my driveway and I kind of don't. Mountain lions are one of those things you kind of want to see from in your car from a distance. But um, we're going to do the search, 161 Montclair Drive, Scotts Valley. Right, and I'm only just doing the t number one result. We resume the map, and there's our parcel right there. And there's the park she went into. That was Henry Cole. Um, so now we're going to say, okay, th there's a fire here. Right, it's jumped over. We need to tell people, how about we do two kilometers? Does that sound good? Because that's actually really ex Well, let's start small and work our way up to it. Let's do like just 100 meters. All right, we're going to do a search. So that's actually returning it back. We have now back all the addresses, and we can know how many acres they are. That was, a that was only 13 parcels found, as you can tell. And then I can click here on the notify service, and it hadn't really, I didn't really text anybody. That's really just a, an imagination of what might happen. But that's what the person can do, right? Another custom-built little app that actually your app developers can build and your GIS people can build. So do you want to, let me ask you what you want to see next. Do you want to see that with more features, or do you want to see the code? Which first? More features. More features. Thank you for speaking up. You get us an extra sticker too. Um, I'll do this in a different address. And I think this one's actually in an area where there's more houses. So you can get a, se a sense of rendering speed of everything now. This is actually like a much more, oh no, maybe it's not. All right, it's this feature right here, right? So we're here. And this time, how many kilometers do you want to do? Since you said more features, pick four kilometers. That's actually quite far. Let's do it. And it's, it's pretty dense, parcel dense here. And that's how fast it comes back, selecting that many parcels. And we just returned 665 parcels. So I actually think that's pretty darn nice performance. Do you want to see the code behind that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Who said that? You get an extra, take an extra hippo, dude. It's all for you. Um, the call for that one, and so this one's doing spatial stuff, right? This one's actually doing spatial stuff. But again, it's actually pretty darn simple. Uh, let me see, this one here. Uh, let me go to this view. Might be able to see it a bit better, so raw. It's this SQL, that's the geocode SQL. Oh, here's the parcel ones, right? There's, because we're returning that table, I put a bit more, most of this is actually just the fields I want back saying, get me as text. What am I doing here? Bonus points, quick, quick, quick. Transform what is the transformation doing? Reprojection. You guys need to pick up the pace over here. Do you see how fast they were on that? You guys are in danger of failing the semester. Um, basically, we're reprojecting now to 4326 because that's actually the coordinate system that's going to be easiest for us to do something with that I can't remember when we built this. Do you remember why? Why I wanted to project to 4326? What? Yeah, it was the JSON stuff, I think. No, I don't return. Oh, thank you for reminding me, though. This is where Paul and I disagree greatly. I do not think in your own custom-built apps you should return GeoJSON. I think that's a waste. GeoJSON is a great interchange format, but if you're controlling your own app, you should know what's getting passed between the front end and the back end. There's no need for some standard interchange. Make it as small as possible. If you see, what am I returning here? Am I returning GeoJSON? No, I'm just giving back basically the field and then the, the well-known text representation of that geometry. Because open, it's, I, I don't even know that cruft. Why spend all that extra data across? GeoJSON's heavyweight. Even though it's JSON without the square brackets, it's heavyweight compared to your own custom JSON. We'll have words later. If you want to watch Paul, well, he's got like reach on me. If you want to see me run away from Paul later, we'll be out in the lobby. Don't return GeoJSON in your own applications. 
it's on. Um, so I'm going to return the, the well-known text representation. I'm projecting it. I'm returning the, parse, the unique ID. What does this operator do in SQL? Concatenation. This has nothing to do with PostGIS. The only part, and then the only parts that are PostGIS are this and this part. Right? So now we're saying, this is where Paul helped me a lot, self-join. Join assessor parcels B on where the A geometry is within this radius of the B geometry. Right? It's a self-join. It's awesome. I was going to be like writing subqueries. Paul can explain the logic on this later afterwards because I was like, oh, that's awesome, but I would never have known how to do that on my own. So this is why learning a bunch of SQL will actually pay off a lot because I was thinking of writing subqueries that would have been slower or maybe I'd do some sort of matching in Python, but this little bit of SQL is super duper fast, which you saw how fast that query was, and it's really compact. So we're doing a self-join and we're saying we're the two geometries, the B, I think the A geometry where do we do it? Is it the A geometry? As I think it's the A geometry that's the one that we have, and then we want to know all the other ones that are within. Oh no, B G I D. So B is the one that where we pulled back the parcel. We said this is the parcel. Find all the ones that are near it within that radius. I totally confused everyone on that one, but that's the only spatial stuff that you need: the S T D within, and this part right here, right? No complicated geospatial processing engines or anything like that. Just straight up SQL. And we return it back and we get it that fast. You want to see the geocode call? Yeah? yeah? That, who, was, who said that that way? That was awesome. Thanks for, I really, you get another hippo. That was like enthusiastic and like made me want to go on. Um, here's the geocode SQL. Select, I'm getting back the X and the Y because I want to recenter the map, right? I want to. Along with the geocode, I want to resend, send a point back that says recenter on this. So I get the X. So the geo geom out, the G geom out is the geometry returned from the geocoder. Right? So I'm saying give me the X and the Y and the actual geometry, and it's in binary format, so I'm not going to transform it, from Tiger geocode. This is the address, so pass in the address. This is the, all the work right here. Tiger geocode, the address. And you know that this is going to return a table that's called G as G. Does that make sense? So that's how easy it is to use the geocoder. And the fun, you want to know another fun anecdote? Or are you done with my fun anecdotes? Do you like them still? You're good? Okay, the fun anecdote was, my days with geocoders was back in like 2004, 2005, 2006. How many of you worked with geocoders back then? How many of you were alive back then? Just kidding. How many of you, did any of you work with geocoders back then? It was so cumbersome. Like you basically had to do all the parsing of the address yourself. Like what's the number? What's the name? What, and you had to fill in a form somewhere in desktop and then you were m amazed though that it came back with a result. So when Paul said like, oh, PushGS has got a geocoder built in, I was like, oh. I'm going to have to parse the address and throw that in. I don't want to, how about we do your, just your free text one? That sounds nicer. And he's like, no, 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 no. You can just pass an address and it'll work. I was like, no way. And it did. So that was, that's the fun anecdote that I was super excited about how much easier it was to use the geocoder than I was expecting it to be. Um, but the same, th if I geocode my house, since this is recording, I'm not going to, but if I geocode my house, you actually see the problem that Paul was talking about where this geocoder is basically interpolating along a road, my house is on, in the geocoder is a good 600 meters away from my, where my house actually is. So I don't want UPS using this or FedEx, right? But it would be good enough if I was trying to get what zip code is this in, what tr census tract is this in, probably tract, yeah. Probably, maybe not block group, block group would be, probably block group though. But so if you're doing bulk geocoding and you wanna then use that point that comes out in some sort of spatial join, Yes. You want to use it to route people? No. All right. So that's the whole code. Uh, I don't think there's anything else in the app that I really have to show you. I think that's the whole demo. All right? Uh, let me consult my script. Yep, that's it. I showed you how we did it. So that's the whole demo. Um, again, to tie it all back to the, what we started with, this is the diagram I showed you about what you could build.
And I think that's what we built today, right? So this is Tegla, although it actually te Tegla should, this one should be Tegla, because it's talking about you This is Tegla, this is the little REST services I wrote, and how much spatial did I actually have to incorporate? I had to know basic, basic, basic post-GIS. And there was nothing actually really, I could have done a sub-query, it just wouldn't have been as performant. So don't get us hung up like, that query looked really hard. That was just a really good query. And then what was this? That's tile server GL. Because it's serving up the Mapbox tiles. It just happens that the Mapbox tiles are inside of the container. Does that make sense? This is, this is the crunchy stuff that we spun up using the operator. So I, it's actually not just one PostGIS database, I had multiples. Oh, I forgot to show you the other thing that was really cool, though. Do you want to know the other thing that was really cool? All my, first of all, all the things I was doing, they were running if magically to the app. They were all running through Bouncer. So I didn't even have to think about connection pooling. It just got connection pooling for free, which was beautiful. Because if you look at Python and connection pooling, I don't think they actually really do it. Like, I talked to my Django friends, and I was like, well, they kind of use the connection. Okay, kind of janky, kind of janky. And then, what was the other beautiful thing I was going to tell you? Oh, the, is the geocoder read operations or write operations? Geocoder. Is it a read operation? Is it a write operation? What is it? What are you doing against the database with the geocoder? This is a, it's not a trick question. You can't answer. You got enough help. It's a read operation, right? So do I actually need to have access to the to the primary? No. So if you if you look at my code, if I go back to my code again. If I can find it, um, it's this one, right? I have two different connections. So this is the connection for the write operations and, and for most of the other stuff. And there I'm actually talking to the bouncer. For the geocoder, I'm actually talking to the replica service, right? Because there's no need for me to, the write, your, your primary should really, you should res in, depends on your app. Can in certain architectures say, look, my primary, all I'm going to do to my primary is write operations. I don't want to tie that down. I don't, that's, and that's expensive, and that's where stuff is going on, and that's stateful. Like when I write stuff, that's kind of stateful because it has to keep track of transactions and stuff like that. When I do a read, that doesn't happen at all. So if I wanted to scale out my, let's say my geocoder is not happening fast enough, or I've got a lot of people coming in and doing geocoders, how would I scale out now? If I, because I've made it just recently replicas, how would I scale? Just make more replicas. Sorry? More read replicas. Yeah, more read replicas. Just have a hundred replicas. Right? And then and then Bouncer is actually going to pool all my connections against all 100 of those. So if you find that your CPU is getting pegged and your database is slowing down and writes aren't happening, in this modern after architecture, you could do the exact same things you would do before. Fine, I'll just put all my read operations on replicas and make lots and lots of replicas. <coughs> right? So you can scale without having to actually, ver you can horizontally scale without vertically scaling. And it makes it really, I, I can't remember the exact phrase. You wanna, hold on. Do you wanna see me scale up the replicas on my, this one back here? I have to just remember the phrase, that's the problem. Okay, so we have a primary, which is this one, and this is the replica, and it's a PGO operation. So you have to bear with me, this is kind of on the fly that I wasn't planning on doing, which always is fun for the audience. Uh, PGO. Oops. Scale. PGO. Scale. See, this is you get to see an, an expert in action. Um, scale. I think I just say scale. Yeah, that's about it. I don't know how you. Oh, yeah, replica count. Okay. You want to scale up three of them? We were at one replica. Do you want to have two more replicas added to it? Okay. PGO scale dash dash replica dash count equals. I think this is going to bring it up to three. I can't remember off the top of my head. And then the name of the cluster, what did we call it? SC Fire? No, I don't think so. Fire data. Fire data. And the namespace is. Fire. And the other problem we have, though, is I think my port forwarding went down. Yeah. Let's put our port forward back up directly. So this is basically setting up a port forward directly from my machine into the container running the PGO operator. Okay. 
So I do that. I hit enter. Are you sure? <laughs> I do everything. I make all my commits to master on GitHub. Um, this is how I live. So there they go. They're starting to spin up. All right, there's a new one. And you can see at this, at this point, the replica is coming up. It's gray, so that means it's pulling the container in. Means that we may not have that container on that node that it's spinning up in. I think we've already spun up another one though, probably, right? Oh no, maybe this is gets us to three. I don't know. There, it's staged, but it's not ready yet. So now we're actually waiting for Postgres to start and return and say it's healthy. It started, but it, we're not going to serve anything from it yet until it turns this color. Okay. But that's how hard it was to scale up the number of replicas. And scale down is basically the same command again. Any other questions? Good? All right. So I think we're all done. Unless people want us. Oh, no. How much time do I have? Am I over? It's a feature fun show. You ready? You want to see what I also can do with these containers that's awesome? You can, you can go to the mixer if you want to go to the mixer, but you're going to miss some fun stuff. So this was our primary, right? I can go to that. I can go actually. Uh, hold on. Let me do this again. It's quicker to go this way. I can actually, this will actually probably give most of the government people shivers, but I can go into the terminal in the container and I can do psql dev and I think the data, database is called demo db. And now I'm actually executing my SQL directly against that database in the container. Want to see something else I can do? Watch this. Now this one's a little, this I'm holding out, this one you have to realize that we're doing port forwarding and there would be, if I was doing this for reals, I would do it a different way. I'm actually going to port forward to my primary database over part 5432. Why is port 5432 important? Nobody who's answered so far can answer. No, what's 5432? It's the port for Postgres. That was good enough. It was good, I'll give it to you. You can have a hippo. <laughs> but I've actually now set up a port forward for my machine to 5432. I've forgotten, oh, here we are. I've got QGIS up. I connected to it earlier when Paul was telling us all those exciting things. I've already set up the username and password. I'm now talking to my Postgres instance running in Kubernetes, making live updates on the fly if I wanted to. Right, and those would be reflected on the map in real time. Is this something you probably want as your production scenario for most use cases? No. But suppose you're managing wildfires and you're updating locate the boundaries of the wildfires in real time. That is not a situation where you're like, okay, well, we have a 10-step QA, QC process and it's got to go through the file. Like, you basically want that information out there as soon as possible for the first responders in the field looking at their phone where you're showing there's a hotspot here, there's a hotspot here, someone's reporting something here. So the reason I'm showing this is because there are going to be GIS analysts in your firm who are going to want to do this kind of stuff or need to do this kind of stuff. This architecture does not preclude you from that. It just doesn't require it, which is the nice part, right? So now I can show you. Oh, I can, you want me to edit the geometry now that the demo's done? Now I can really mess things up. So this is that same area we were looking at. That was that park. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait a second. Wrong thing. Give me that. It's always really good to edit with a mouse pad. And now if I save it, does anybody remember how to save the transaction? What, the pencil? Help me out. Uh, this one. That one, right? Don't I You want to save? Yeah, I can say still say save. No, save, save. Okay, let's, oh yeah, this is why the government people like don't let anybody do this on in public live. So if I go back and I reload the page, and I go, I think that's where we start our map we should have a totally janky parcel now. Isn't that wonderful? This is like, that's my worst nightmare. Why did, you just, why did you just show that? I mean, the other thing is, that's why I had that old permission layer built in, right? And this is where Postgres permissions would be in. This, you wouldn't be like, hey, everybody, you have right privileges to the master database, right? This would be like a select few that would be the appointed few that could come in through just talk, right? Um, but it gives you a much nicer workflow. And you can use standard tools. Right, I actually could have, well, except for the, this geometry, I didn't, everything I could have done, I could have just done at the psql command line today. Right, I didn't need some sort of enterprise site license for some piece of software or teaching people how to use stuff, or QJS, but I didn't even need that. So, all right, I think I'm all done. Thanks.